Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able and On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Able Dinner and Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Uh, Arlene is not here today, but we would like to say um, special thanks to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the partnerships with Einstein Hospital of the Bronx, M Montefiore Hospital of the Bronx, and uh, the Rose F. Kennedy Center of the Bronx, and many other supporters and sponsors. Um, <clears throat> with us to discuss the important topic of um, COVID and people with special needs and a very important grant in New York City and the state of New York with COVID and people with special needs is Dr. Karen Bonock of Einstein um, Hospital of the Bronx and uh, Joanne Siegel, of the Rose F. Kennedy Center. Welcome to Able Den On Air. Hi. Hi, Thank how you. are you? Um, can you tell us a little bit, uh, well, can you tell us a lot about the grant and why and how it got started and the importance of it? Well, maybe I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you might say a little over a year ago, I looked around and I saw that there was likely a need for vaccine education for people with developmental disabilities. Um, I actually reached out to our some of our clinicians and our leadership, and particularly, um, you know, in different languages to to get information out there. And um, I think people thought that maybe I was getting a little bit ahead of the curve. The vaccines were just starting to roll out and said, hold off. Um, at the same time, I contacted the New York State Developmental Disabilities uh, Planning Council and um, put forth the idea of a vaccine education project aimed at developing uh, different media initiatives and getting out science-based information. And um, they agreed that it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what this is just a broad overview. What um, we were funded for one year um, to um, produce different, um, you know, web and in-person segments geared towards various um, pop subpopulations of persons with developmental disabilities, Spanish speakers, Chinese speakers, etc. Um, and we also did some research, and lo and behold, some of those folks from the clinical staff. Uh, who initially were like, we shouldn't get out in front, have actually 
been some of our, our best spokespeople and been completely supportive of our project. So um, that's just a brief overview. How, how simplify or how do you have to simplify um, this information? You know, because people with special needs, depending on their challenge, uh, whether it be autism, learning disability, they learn at a different speed and get information at a different pace. Yeah. So how do you how do you have to simplify, you know, people are also scared of, oh my God, vaccine, I'm scared to take it. How do you simplify this information for people with special needs? Well, two ways. Um, number one, is we have people um, who have intellectual or developmental disabilities speaking, making the videos. They can be found on our website. I think we can share them with you after uh, the links. Um, so they're speaking the same language. You're mm -hmm. getting it from your peers. The other um, means by which we do this is the experts that we engage to do this education are experts in working with people with developmental disabilities. And to be honest, clear, plain, lay language is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, the, but not to be confused with being um, dumbed down. I have to say every time we do a Why webinar. Why did you say, I apologize, why did you say dumbed down? What's the reason? Some people think or may perceive that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are not able to grasp concepts or scientific concepts, but you can, you know, transmit those concepts with a three syllable word, maybe instead of an eight syllable word, there's always a better way to say it. Mm -hmm. And those are principles of universal design. And we have found that the audiences uh, that we have put on numerous webinars for people with DD, their family members, um, easily grasp what COVID is, how the vaccines work. Um, we explain it in a way that would be universally acceptable, which is the way we need to do it. So it is, and you know, they often comment that this was very respectful. Mm -hmm. You gave me science-based information in a way I can understand. So uh, Joanne, do you want to chime in with this as well? Yes, so what we do for each of the, the, the presentations the speakers, we go over the slides to make sure that individuals that might be viewing understand them and can relate to them. We have included um, special presentations with the New York State uh, SANIS, Self Advocacy Association of New York State, mm -hmm. and have had panelists who are individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities participate in our presentations. Um, what we have found essentially is that many people are aware of what's happening. They watch the news, they hear the news, they are concerned, and um, they are very responsive to what is being presented, and they ask many questions. I will say that at times, um, for people who are living at home, remain at home. Mm -hmm. um, we do get questions about my family doesn't want me to get the vaccine, but mm. I would like to get the vaccine. Um, <clears throat> and that comes up. And um, we try to address that as best we can. And we do indicate that that person needs to be discussing it with their family member because that is then, it becomes an individual issue and a family issue. But these are, they're valid, very valid questions that come up. Um, and to date, I have to say that um, many of the people that might, um, you, you might think um, would not understand what is going on, they actually understand, they've been listening, and they are, um, they are very responsive to the education pieces that are going out there on the media. So, you know, I, I, I know we're pleased with that. Um, and so that's an important uh, point to make. Do, now, okay, so you go to, you deal with individual households. Is the training a little bit different or slightly different if you go into a group home setting? Yes or no? 
and, right. and how? Okay, we have not gone into group home settings per se. Mm -hmm. Let me explain the backgrounds a little bit of, of some of the pro, some of the presentations. Um, <clears throat> um, essentially, we do our presentations as community outreach. And so we're presenting to um, family organizations, maybe advocacy groups, um, mm -hmm. and we will go into this a little bit from various ethnic backgrounds. Um, we have agencies that work with families that are um, Hispanic, Chinese, uh, Korean, um, uh, individuals from, from um, Bengali backgrounds that we've made presentations with. We use interpreters. We use um, uh, American Sign Language. Mm -hmm. So we're going to a very broad community outreach. Including, um, in, if you don't mind me asking, in, including Hebrew, if, in case somebody needs that? Would you do other languages other than? We have, we are essentially, we do have some limitations, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so we have limited it to the five um, major languages other than English that are spoken in the United States because we just don't have capacity to, to include every single language. Mm -hmm. um, but we try our best um, to, to reach those major uh, groups. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so to get back to who, who are the presentations for, they're for family members and individuals. They can come on if they're living in the community. We work with agencies because, and I can go into some statistics on that, um, organizations have asked for presentations because their staff are hesitant, perhaps, um, in getting a vaccine. So we've made many presentations to or agency organizations for their staff, as well as their individuals. And, um, and we have also worked with care coordinating organizations that would be working directly with families living in the community, okay? And, and so that gives you an idea um, of how. Example of, of care organizations that, go ahead. Okay, in New York State, there are seven care coordinating organizations that work with families to develop plans of care mm -hmm. for individuals that are eligible for state funding through the office, uh, New York State Office for People with Developmental Dis Disabilities. In New York City, um, there are three. Mm -hmm. uh, Care Design of New York, yep. Tri-County Care, yep. and ACA. And those are the individuals, those are the organizations. ACA, that we, ACA stands for? Um, Agency for Community um, Alliances, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, how does the, it, um, I mean, this might have to do with it, but I noticed that you, you guys are also part of the Disability University or something along those lines. Um, how has this COVID education uh, been part of that? Or like, is it more part of that? Because also you, you're, you're, you're um, helping the medical school teach this as well and... So well, let me just clarify mm -hmm. um, that relationship. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. No, no, no. So uh, there's a lot of acronyms, like short names, that are very confusing for everyone. Um, Joanne and I co-direct the Rose F. Kennedy University Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, you said. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. You said or Programs Without Walls. Mm -hmm. um, but as a, um, as a requirement of the Federal Developmental Disabilities Act, mm -hmm. they are required to be hosted within a university. So wow. that's our relationship, is that the Einstein College of Medicine, where Joanne and I both hold faculty appointments, mm -hmm. um, so Einstein is the host for our USED. So our USED, like you wouldn't drive up to Einstein and see a building that says USED on the you know outside of the building but mm -hmm. we work closely with um the rose f kennedy um how do i say children's evaluation and rehabilitation center mm -hmm. another acronym mm -hmm. SIRS. um there are many adult self-advocates affiliated with that work so it's not a great name mm -hmm. um but that's so and there are 67 of these two sets and they all work on the type of activities we do. So a USED has a fourfold mission, okay? 
One of them is community training and technical assistance, mm -hmm. which is what this is a large part of our vaccine education. Let's see if I can get all this right. Okay. Um, there's information dissemination, which is uh, the emails, the Twitter that we put out, the all the ways we, we disseminate content. There's research, which I have been taking the lead on. And then there's um, advocacy, right? Is that it, Joanne? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, these vaccine grants really encompass much of the, you no know, two USEDs are alike. Mm -hmm. uh, they all carry out their missions in different ways, depending upon the catchment area. Our catchment area, the area of people we serve, mm. is the five boroughs of New York City, as well as Long Island, which is, um, I'm not sure where most of your uh, listeners are from, but it's- um, Well, we're, the... we, we, we broadcast because, you know, um, special needs, topics and special needs is global, not just mm -hmm. local. So we, we broadcast, uh, you know, I've, I've been a broadcaster for 30 years in this area, both in New York and now mm -hmm. Vermont. So Vermont, you know, is New England. So you never know who's watching or listening. Um, that's why we do these topics because they're important. But yeah, um, I see your point there um, as far as that. Now, and just, can I just go on? So go ahead. many of the USEDs um, mm -hmm. are doing some sort of vaccine education. And in fact, mm -hmm. I think it was 11 of us, I think, right, Joanne? I think 11 USEDs received some uh, special funding from the Centers for Disease Control to carry out this work. So that's a separate small grant that really complements the larger grant we got from our New York State Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. And as a group, we meet um, it's once a month mm -hmm. uh, to kind of share resources. Does anyone have a video in Korean? Oh, I have a video in Korean. Does anyone have a video of a mom in ASL? And does anyone have an infographic? Do you know what I'm saying? So we actually, we work on a national scope as well. Now, well, we understand, I mean, um, as the nature of things, people are also scared of taking the vaccine. Now, my question around this is, um, are there, now you said videos, so um, how do the videos come into play when, when you're doing this COVID education if someone is scared to take the vaccine? So, <clears throat> our, so there's two types of videos. One would be more like public service announcements on uh, not, it, it's explaining the importance of getting a vaccine. Mm -hmm. That's one component. Mm -hmm. For areas that really like anxiety mm -hmm. and depression that have come up, yeah. particularly during the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. um, we have offered actual webinars mm -hmm. where our psychologists come, uh, have, have presented on mental health issues mm -hmm. during COVID, anxiety, um, depression. And then for children, unfortunately, um, sometimes there's bullying around um, COVID. How, how is child. bullying play into this? <laughs> it's very interesting because I, I didn't realize this until we spoke with some of the family members. And that's why we kind of like, we kind of frame our presentations based on the feedback that families give us. So mm -hmm. one of the families had mentioned that their child um, had gotten COVID. And then of course there was a quarantine and the child then, but when the quarantine was over, came back to school and then experienced bullying by other students saying, we're not gonna associate with you. You had COVID, um, we might get sick. We don't wanna be near you. And so people have to learn how to respond um, in a fashion that is, um, that is not um, hostile, but mm. how, do you, how do you respond to people when they are bullying? And so techniques were provided during that webinar, which are really helpful. How do um, the by the way, in, in the chat, I did put the links for our, um, for our social media. Mm -hmm. And so that's in the chat. Right okay, now. so you, we'll go over that after the show. Uh, how does self-advocacy, or how do the self-advocates of New York State help play into this education? Okay, so on December 10th of ju just this past year, um, at the New York State statewide 
conference for SANUS, Self Advocacy Association of New York State, mm -hmm. we had a um, 45 minute. No, it was it was a little longer. It was about an, an hour and 15 minutes. Sorry, workshop on COVID 19, in which basic information was given by a, a medical person, mm -hmm. but the rest of the presentation was really a panel presentation by self-advocates. And so it was mm -hmm. titled COVID-19 Self-Advocates Speak Out. Mm -hmm. And they talked about their personal stories mm -hmm. during a period of COVID. Um, and, and then they fielded questions uh, remotely. This was all done remotely uh, from the audience. So that, that was our latest um, event that we, we Was held. this sign, with sign language interpretation as well or no? Uh, no, Sa Sanus did not provide sign language interpretation. It was their conference and we were invited to give a presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, in terms of uh, what other activities or what other education, um, I mean, both of you can chime in. Uh, um, what are the education that is really important that we can talk about with the COVID situation that's extremely important? Karen, do you want to talk about the clinics that were held? Sure. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> at the Rose F. Kennedy Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center in June, we had our initial clinic mm -hmm. for children. I think uh, it was in May that the vaccines From were authorized. five and up, right? Cause no, May was they were authorized for 12 and up. Okay. I'm in sorry. October, they were authorized for five and up. Yeah. No, that's okay. It's hard to keep it straight. but um, Because little ch children, infants are not able to get, them, to get it yet. Yeah. So it was authorized for children 12 and up in May by the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. In late June, the, our, our center, our clinical center, held... Um, a clinic and what was different about it is that we had um, that one was staffed by I think primarily some of our we have dental we have actually a dental clinic that provides services to people with developmental disabilities on on the campus on the site with the main health center there mm -hmm. and so some of the residents those are people who are getting trained in dentistry um, went there and they brought with them different toys and kind of distractions to help children who were um, really, really nervous, you know, kind of with behavioral techniques mm. in terms of distraction and feeling more comfortable. And then the follow-up clinic was in July. And then it was just uh, last Friday, I believe, right? Um, mm -hmm. We held another clinic for the five and up uh, for children. Um, and the idea was that to give um, parents the peace of mind for many people with developmental disabilities, presenting for a medical appointment is anxiety producing on its own. What, what, um, okay, well, um, anxiety comes in many forms, correct? So how does, how does the anxiety play into, you know, obviously you're going to try and calm the person down, like, and then they get scared when they see a needle or vaccine. So, uh, so go ahead. How how, how yeah, does exactly? Yeah. So these are so the clinics that are held, or again, it's not like going into your CVS where it's the sales clerk checks you in, and then you know the pharmacist. You know, these are people who like those who deliver the webinars and are able to speak in sort of plain language. These are people who are skilled mm -hmm. at understanding these special anxieties or and or sensory issues, right? That mm -hmm. can often be more common and they're sensitive to that. They're able to take more time. It's not like, okay, we just have five minutes. We have to vaccinate the next person. Um, so there's time, there's distractions, there's clinical skill. Um, there was a room for people who needed to just kind of like really decompress and not have so much going on. So uh, yeah, they do that in the Special Olympics. They have a special they they have a special room that uh, turns around and um, huh? Okay. Uh, yeah, we lost power from it. Are we okay? Okay, are you still recording? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Let me repeat. Yeah, um, Special Olympics, 
does that very thing. Like, at the end of each event, if, if they still have another event, they can go and de decompress and then come back you know, and do more activities. So, yeah, certain other organizations do the same thing, pretty much. Um, but, yeah, um, so go ahead. Um, can yeah, you explain a little bit much, more? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's pretty much, you know, what I want to say. So it's an environment that is sensitive to um, the needs of this population who has the time and the tools and the clinical skills. And I believe that, I believe that every child who presented to get vaccinated, they were able to successfully vaccinate. And sometimes these parents had brought previously brought their child to another site and uh, were not able to. So that's a real success. So what, um, in your opinion, what causes people, especially some people with challenges, you know, developmental disabilities, what causes people not to want to get vaccinated? Is there a, are they that scared? Or, um, I mean, I mean, what do you I think? I mean, in many ways, um, I'm not talking about the children who, you know, don't make the decision, you know, when they're under 18. But in many ways, it's just like someone who doesn't have a developmental disability. We understand that there's a lot of the same misinformation and mm. myths that are out there are so, also reaching... So do you think the media, do you think the media is just giving too much of Not the, the mainstream media, no. I'm saying there is, you know, it is known that there are 12 individuals, I think I read this somewhere, who are responsible for spreading 75% of the misinformation on mm -hmm. social media. Okay, the mm -hmm. mainstream media, your ABC News, uh, USA Today, is not spreading misinformation. So no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. But people sometimes see something on Facebook and then they share that link. I know there are attempts to try and stop that. Mm -hmm. If something is to, to label some of those posts of misinformation, but they're out there. People have, sir, I don't even you know, want to give them any credibility by repeating them. Mm -hmm. um, but what our webinars in particular do is it goes through from a scientific point of view, this is not possible. Yes, the vaccines, did come onto the market quickly in terms of a certain type of vaccine. But just so you know, the process, right, this mRNA, messenger RNA process has been around and worked on for quite a long time. I can't remember. You know, at exactly. least 10 years. At yeah, least 10 yeah. years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you want to chime? You want to chime into that? Is yeah, that... I, I also want to mention because, and Karen will will add to this. Mm -hmm. um, we've been involved in surveys of parents' attitudes toward the vaccine, uh, and okay. what it has shown us is that for um, for young for young children and, and children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, the main concern of the parents is actually um, understandable. Their concern is they are they worry about um, will a vaccine cause more harm to their child in terms of their disability than not getting the vaccine. And some people, if you don't mind me chiming in here, some people claim religious exemption, which I I pretty much some some religions don't allow vaccinations, so. Um, there is, my, to my understanding, I don't believe there, I believe the Pope has endorsed vaccinations. Yes. yes. My understanding is, I, I think it's like two, I think it's Seventh Day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. Amish have, also. Um, the Amish, Amish. Yeah, yeah, have some issues with, let's say, blood transfusions or something else. Um, but that's not the main reason. In fact, that is among the people who might have some concerns about vaccines, like we split the, the sample people who were eager to get it and those who were not so eager among the not so eagers, that was perhaps the lowest reason. The other reason were concerns about the child's development, et cetera. But just to put a fine point on what Joanne said in our last survey of parents, we actually found that the willingness to get the vaccine was higher for parents of kids with developmental disabilities than it was in um, other research for parents of children in the general population. Mm -hmm. They're actually more eager Okay, mm -hmm. and there, um, when we asked what would be a big reason why you might not get it, 
very few of them mentioned for that group is interesting misinformation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, it, misinformation isn't the biggest reason. It's concern, and, and the other concern that's special to this population was uh, a question. Were there, and this was with adults as well, were there people with developmental disabilities in the sample, right? So they didn't ask when they were um, enrolling people in the vaccine trials, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but um, we know that, you know, by chance there, there was a likelihood that there were people, but they didn't ascertain that, they didn't ask that. And this is actually, this is a side topic that- um, uh, I'm you know, sorry, maybe, I apologize. <laughs> This is a side topic that maybe in the future we can do another show on about the inclusion of people with disabilities in research. Yeah, but as, statistics as about disabilities are not often included in these trials, so we don't know. It, well, talking about research for for and about people with special needs, since you said that. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, how, you know, vaccines such as the polio vaccine and others in years past. Have, do you know if they've, um, or did they just start to include people with special needs in like research and development of vaccines? Because vaccines do save lives. So, uh, um, right? So do you know, well, since you're a medical doctor, do, ha, have I'm they- I'm not a medical doctor. Excuse okay, me. I not apologize. Doctor. Nothing I say should be, Construed as medical advice. I'm a, actually a PhD in social. You're a PhD. Work and a I'm sorry. I apologize. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. apologize. But okay, have they just started including people with special needs? This has been going on for years, or is you know, it is it is more recent? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Larry. This should be another show. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Joanne and I are now working on a. No, no, no. I don't mean. I'm saying there's so much. We are working on a grant application to look at what are the roadblocks to including people with developmental disabilities in research. Mm -hmm. I just read a paper that came out um, a few years ago. Well, a paper that came out two days ago in the New England Journal of Medicine calls for more disability inclusion in research, of course. And then I have um, a paper that I read from three years ago that um, the number of studies that even ask if a person has a developmental disability is very small. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. So this is an area that we need to expand. Okay, so let's get back to COVID, the COVID situation. Um, so what is, since we only have some time, a couple of minutes left, what, what is, um, well, obviously we don't know the future of um, this COVID vaccination. Um, what, what, what might be the future of this COVID education and how much more will it go on, do you, do you think? Um, well, ahead. we are, just so you know, we are um, hoping to renew our uh, grant from the Developmental Disabilities Planning Council with a little bit of a different focus, to be honest. Uh, one of the, the main focus will be additional funding for different languages. It may sound like a small thing, but you can't imagine how many hours a week our team spends seeking out um, translation and interpretation services, um, making sure we have the correct American Sign Language interpretation. We have found that there is a great need for uh, being culturally responsive. So that is a, a new kind of shift, not new. Jo Joanne, do you wanna add to that? Anything else you wanna add to that piece? No, I think that, well, I think that Karen has said it succinctly. I, I, I do think though, we originally were funded for um, the one year. Mm -hmm. We will be getting funding to go forward at least another year because um, no one anticipated the length of time that the pandemic would be with us. And now with different variants emerging, um, we kind of have to then sit back and reassess where we're going. And so a little of this the planning is on a day-to-day -day basis based on scientific information coming in. So I think we have our work cut out for us. I think there'll be more, even after the pandemic, there will be an analysis of how people responded, how mm -hmm. do we respond to the next um, pandemic that may, that may arise, um, and how do we work with people with disabilities because we still 
are looking at, um, there's a lot of ethical issues in terms of, New York State has been very good in mm -hmm. terms of distribution of the vaccines. And um, as far as, now, quick, uh, quick thing, do you, so you put this out in webinars, you put this out in computer information, you put it out on Facebook, you, you put it out in pamphlets, correct? No, mostly in, in um, I'm going to say, in, in, in internet and, and social yeah. media okay. platforms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Although, actually, um, I should mention, we had an excellent webinar that was uh, training mm. done by our uh, interim director, Dr. Lisa Shulman. She's a developmental behavioral pediatrician. Mm -hmm. It was specifically focused on answering, question, answering the questions parents would have about vaccinating their children. That was extremely well received, so mm -hmm. well received, in fact, that the uh, Centers for Disease Control actually has that on their website. Uh -huh. And that was written up, the transcript, a summarized transcript or recording of what was said, was written up and published in Exceptional Parent. Oh, okay. Just coming out. Yes, just coming out, out of the press. <laughs> out of the press. Um, mm -hmm. So can... Uh, can you tell people where to, uh, where to turn and the website where where people can get this information and how you know about this um, the COVID webinars and so on and so forth? So I put in the chat. Um, we have a, have our social media platforms, and I put in the links on the chat. Um, and so that's the best way to to reach us. So it's we have a, a Twitter handle. Um, and we have LinkedIn, so on our Facebook um, page as so well. So it's not. It, so and it's, our website actually lists many yeah. of our webinars. If one were to go to the Rose F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. you could just put in RFK. RFK space space U C E D D U E C D D. No, -E -C -D -D. Uh, no, no, no. You know I'm what? Sorry. I'll put it the link in because there's a lot of acronyms here. I'll put the link in. Okay. okay. And this is all within uh, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, mm -hmm. and you can do a search on that for our use it. And it it has our our actually the name of the we we try to um have a popular name for the project, and it's called Vax Facts mm -hmm. D D N Y. I'm putting the link in right now mm -hmm. to the Vax Vax DDNY. Um, dot, dot org, right? Well, no, I, I put just the whole link. You could just click on that. Okay. Okay. Let me really quick. It won't get rid of you. Let me just, I uh, just want to. Mm -hmm. So it would be, okay, www.vaxfax.ddny. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, but it, so then it also links people to the, the Albert Einstein website as well, correct? It's through that, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Able to Learn. Um, uh, for more information on the COVID education and uh, what New York City is doing uh, through um, the, along with the Centers for Disease Control um, and uh, COVID education and people with special needs, you can go to um, the Einstein's website. First is www.einsteinmed. Uh, is it dot .org, correct? I, Einstein. Dot .edu. They dot just edu. changed it okay. like six months so ago. So www.einsteinmed.edu or www. Uh, vaxfacts.ddny. Um, uh, well, we would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Able Den On Air. Uh, and there will be plenty more uh, uh, shows on medical information when it comes to people with special needs. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Dr. Karen Bonuck of Weinstein uh, Medical Center and um, Joanne Siegel of the Rosa Kennedy Center, um, you said, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this puts an end to this edition of Able Den On Air. As always, thank you to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many other partners, including Ein uh, Einstein Hospital of uh, Bronx, New York, uh, and um, the 
uh, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York as well. Uh, I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time on the next edition of Able Then On Air. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press, media editors, New York Parrot online newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.